How do we click or not click with people? There's both verbal and nonverbal cues. Are you good at picking up social cues? Let's talk about that today. I'm Brad Shore, and welcome to Ask a Shrink. Hang on. You know, in my private practice, sometimes clients say to me, I just don't get it. Why don't I click with this person? Why don't I get along with them? There's something off. I can't figure out what it is. And that happens in a lot of our lives because sometimes we just don't understand why we can't connect with somebody. We're not sure why. Now, sometimes we just don't have anything in common. Sometimes we're not a good match for each other, either romantically or as friends. And we don't always just get along with all of our coworkers. So sometimes it's that, but sometimes it's because we're not picking up on social cues. Social cues are the nonverbal behavior about how we go through life, how we interpret what we see, how we respond to people or not respond to people. And these social cues are important. And I'm doing this video because for those of you who feel isolated because you're being blocked by people in your life because you don't have a lot of good social cues, so to speak, we need to talk about this because social cues are important. People can turn you off like that if they sense an energy or sense that you're not picking up on what they're all about or what they're trying to convey to you at the present time. They'll just turn their back and they're gone. So let's examine what that means. Body gestures are so important. The posture, how somebody's holding themselves, the look on their face. Even though gestures like this can be quick, fast, and in a hurry, the person who's sensing that or seeing it from the other person makes a lot of quick decisions based on that. It can affect how open they are to you. It can affect how motivated they are to continuing having this conversation with you. It can be all about how they're perceiving you and it's all based on some sort of nonverbal cue. The smile or no smile, the body language, there's the posturing, there's the nodding or the shaking of the head, so looking at you in the eye or the eye rolling. Oh my God, can I please get out of here, please. Now some people pick up on that and they're usually empathic people who are good at picking up on people's feelings. Some people are not so good at it. That's okay, nothing's wrong with that. We have different skill levels in different areas of our lives, but you do wanna at least educate yourself about social cues because a lot of this is unconsciously driven. We're not even aware of what we're doing oftentimes unless we talk about it. So one key is have people told you that you behave inappropriately or act inappropriately in certain situations, usually social situations. If you've been told that many times, the chances are you're doing that. You may deny it, you may not wanna face it, you may just ignore them, but chances are it's true. And just the fact that you're ignoring what they're saying gives us some idea for this video that you're not good at picking up on social cues in that way because here's people trying to tell you that you're behaving or acting inappropriately on some level and you're ignoring them. So right there, you're not picking up on a social cue. Now again, this is only if several people have told you the same thing and it's been told to you several times, kind of repeatedly. You need to pay attention to it. So then that leads to the next question. Do you think about how people will be affected by what you say, how you act, what your body language is doing at the moment? Do you think about that? If you can't look people in the eye during a conversation, what's going on with that? That's kind of common, right? To look somebody in the eye. If you're always looking down or looking away, well, people are picking up on that and then probably thinking you're cold or aloof when really it may have nothing to do with that at all. You may be very shy. And oftentimes I know in private practice, with my clients, when a client won't look at me in the eye, I know it's about shame. The shame shows itself by, I don't want people's eyes on me and I really don't wanna look at their eyes either. So it's really about shame. And if you feel that this applies to you, that's something you can talk to a therapist about to work this through. Now, sometimes people come up to people to start a conversation and they just keep rambling on and on and on and talking, talking, talking. And obviously the person they're talking to is going to be turned off. So the intent may be to simply have a conversation, but if you're somebody who over talks, you need to ask yourself why you're doing that and also know that you're pushing people away. You have to ask yourself why are you over talking? You're trying to fill every minute. Is it about nerves, anxiety? Do you feel like you won't get a word in edgewise? Maybe you were raised in a household where you couldn't get a word in edgewise. So now when you talk to people, you feel like you have to keep talking and talking because you weren't allowed to do that as a kid. But a social cue for this, to help you through this, for you over talkers out there, is to look at the face of the person you're speaking to. Do they act interested? Or is their body language telling you that they're trying to get away from you? <laughs> well, if they're trying to get away from you, then you need to examine what's going on here. Maybe you ask people for unsolicited advice at work. Well, sometimes coworkers don't wanna give you advice. They don't feel like that's their place. 
or they may feel like it's their place, but they don't want to give you advice or they don't have any advice to give. So if you're asking for advice and whoever you're asking is not responding to you in a positive way, that's your social cue that they don't have or don't want to give you any advice. So don't keep pressing them on it. Don't keep re-asking or asking in different ways. Let it go. Drop the subject. And with body language, do you get too close to people? Do they tend to move away? Then don't get so close. They're not comfortable. You're getting into their own personal space then. Or on the flip side, maybe you stand way too far from people and they're wondering, why are you standing four feet from me as we're having this conversation? If that's the case and you've been told that, then ask yourself what that's about. Maybe it has to do with some kind of social anxiety. Maybe it has to do with some kind of insecurity or feeling less than the other person. That's something you can explore. When you're explaining something, maybe to a group of people or with your coworkers, do you look to see that they're actually following you? Are they actually listening? If they're not, if their eyes are closed or they're there like this, or yawning, that's a social cue. In, in a conversation, do you interrupt? That can be very rude. If somebody's making a point, it's their turn. They have the floor, but you interrupt them. Now, again, we all do that from time to time. That's okay. That's part of being human. But if you're doing it consistently and many people have told you this is an issue, I'd pay attention to that. Do you look back on most interactions or conversations and realize that really what you did was mostly talk about yourself? Think back right now. Think on some recent conversations that you've had with people. Did you mostly talk about yourself? <laughs> That's a big red flag if you're doing that. And even though people may not be telling you that they find that repulsive, generally speaking, most people do. Now, why is this important? It's important because this will answer your question when sometimes you ask yourself, why can't I connect with this person? Why do I just feel like I can't get close to them? Well, this could be one of the reasons. And we have to ask ourselves very honestly these kinds of questions or we just never know. So if you find that you truly do talk about yourself a lot and you're at home wondering at night why you're alone and can't connect with others, there's your answer. And then the next step is to look at the underlying issues as to why you feel the need to talk about yourself a lot. When you're in a bad mood in a social situation, does everybody know you're in a bad mood? That's not gonna be helpful. It's true, we want to be honest with our feelings, let people know our authentic self, that's very true. But there's also times, especially at the workplace, where we just have to be professional. Our role from nine to five, let's say, is to present a professional side of ourselves that doesn't allow for the bad mood. Well, if you're wondering why you get fired from several jobs, is it because you're bringing your bad mood to work and letting that be seen? So if you're in a bad mood at work, notice that. Be honest with yourself about it. Promise yourself that as soon as you get out of work, you're gonna call a friend and talk about it. Or if you're alone at night, you're gonna journal about it or make an appointment with your therapist and bring that up. You know, I'm in a bad mood a lot and I bring it to work and I can tell I'm pissing people off at work. So the main thing is just to examine it. Just don't shove it away. It's something to work at. If you get a compliment for something, do you feel the need to not only take the compliment, but tell them about all the hard work and all the levels of preparation that it took for you to do A, B, C, D, or E? Well, that person is probably gonna see that as a social cue and thinking like, oh my God, I'm never gonna compliment this person again. So these are social cues to be aware of. If you hear somebody gossiping, do you pick up on it and want more information and it's juicy stuff, you wanna dive in there? Other people are noticing that if you're doing that, or do you politely excuse yourself and leave? If you gossip or like to know gossip, what's that about? Do you feel that empty in your life? Do you feel so much of a void here that a way to work with that void is to garner information about other people's downfalls or problems they're having right now in their life? So that's a red flag if you are. The work is not about what's going on out there. The work is about filling that void inside of you and understanding it more deeply. If a friend or loved one is upset, do you try to get in there and try to solve it for them and try to figure out the best answer for them and give them advice they haven't even asked for? That's way over the top. If they've told you there's a problem in their life, you can certainly listen, give them a shoulder to lean on for a minute or so and tell them you always will be there for them as a good friend or loved one. But that doesn't mean you have to keep probing in there and trying to figure it out and offering assistance that they don't really want. So that's a social cue you have to pay attention to when someone's telling you they have a problem. Yes, it's great to share problems with our friends and loved ones, of course, but follow their lead as to how much they want to reveal or not reveal. Don't think that you need to be a savior or the fix-it man or the fix-it woman when they don't really want that kind of help. That can be determined to some degree by following social cues. And so I'm hoping this helps a little bit. <laughs> Again, nobody's right, nobody's wrong. It's just educating people about the fact that social cues are important and people pay a lot of attention to them more than we realize.
So please leave me some comments below. I'd love to hear about your body language, right? <laughs> please subscribe to my mental health YouTube channel if you like these kind of videos. And until next week, this is Brad Shore signing off from Ask a Shrink.